Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we were just going over some more technical uh, issues. Maybe you're watching this on YouTube, which would be wonderful. That means that it's working, but we don't think it is. So um, that's why we always try and use YouTube and Facebook. So one becomes jittery. Hopefully the other one works out. And at the very least, we try and record the audio as a last resort. Uh, but if you are watching this somehow, welcome. I'm glad you can be here with us this morning. Uh, it's the last day of May, May 31st. Uh, we are having a service where it's recognized it was what we call Pentecost Sunday. Um, as always, the, the same things that I am getting really well at repeating is uh, <clears throat> I'm joined by my wife Sue and our uh, uh, music director for St. Luke's, Jackie. Uh, and also I'm, I'm here as the minister, Bill Grace of St. Luke's Presbyterian Church and St. James Presbyterian Church, Oshawa. Um, Again, hopefully that uh, you are watching this live or watching this as a recording. Either way, you're welcome to uh, be part of this worship time. So if you do locate the uh, order of service that outlines what we'll be singing, the responsive uh, call to worship that we'll be doing, you're invited to take part in that as well. I invite you to do it. And one last announcement. It was... Uh, passed on to me, and I'm happy to uh, send birthday wishes to Margaret, who is the, uh, not, well, she's an elder, but also the clerk of session at uh, St. James Church. So I just want to say happy birthday to Margaret. <laughs> prepare for worship this morning. Uh, if you're able to find the call to worship, which is part of the uh, outline of the order of service, I'll invite you to turn to it at this time. All right. <clears throat> Breathe upon us, Holy Spirit. And inspire our thoughts and actions. Stir in our hearts, Holy Spirit. Strengthen us, Holy Spirit. And move us to bring hope to those in despair. Breathe in us, Holy Spirit. As we worship and witness to God's coming reign. Let us sing together, breathe on me, breath of God. Let us pray. 
Lord, as we gather here this morning, whether it's this Sunday morning or any time through the week or at any time, Lord, may we know that we are in your presence, that you lead us in great ways. May you bless this time of worship, Lord, as we seek to sing, as we pray, as we listen, as we open up scriptures. Lord, may we have our eyes open. May we hear. May we be strengthened. May we know you more. May our hearts be drawn closer to you. May our minds be given to focus on you. This is sweet. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I have our ministry of music. Thank you, Jackie. <clears throat> Scripture reading this morning will start in the book of Numbers. It'll be taken from Numbers chapter 11, verses 24 to 30. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. 
And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A, a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Second reading will be taken from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 41. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were, saying, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Our third reading from the Gospel of John, John chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. John 16, verses 5 through 15. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is what I said, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. The word of the Lord, praise be to God. So as I mentioned earlier, today is what we call Pentecost Sunday. It's an interesting name. It's the um, kind of the Greek version of to give a label for the high Jewish holiday. I might mispronounce it. I believe it's a, a Shavuot or something close to that. But it's 50 days after Passover. But for us, and, and well, the 50, maybe you've heard in that name, Pentecost. Now, if you think of Penta, you might have... Picture the Pentagon, the five-sided building in Washington, or the five-sided shape, if that helps. But Penta here, Pentecost, just means counting the 50 days until the next high feast holiday that they had. But for us, it's no longer about Passover. It's about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ on that Easter weekend. And now Pentecost, which was just going to be another holiday, uh, a high day of, of praise and gathering and feasting, is now something altogether different, that the Holy Spirit now arrives with such power, marking the beginning of what we call the church age, that Jesus promised this advocate, this comforter, this, this guide, this leader that the church would have, and, and here it is. And as I stop to think about the meaning of Pentecost and what we have, I, I realize that lately, I, I've been, well, probably more than lately, for a long time. I've been having this oversight. I've been having this blind spot. And I tend to make it regularly. That if you were to quickly read through what we just looked at, we spent a long time in Acts 2 this morning. That if you weren't to pay attention to all what's going on, you could probably have that same oversight that I had. That just 10 days prior to this event of, of the Holy Spirit coming down upon all these people, that just 10 days prior, they watched Jesus being lifted up to the clouds. And they said about 500 witnesses were there at the time. And we wonder, when, when, the, when the anointing of the Spirit, these questions that we'll just have to wait to hear the final word about, was it just the 11 uh, called disciples that were given this power, or was it just the, the dozens and dozens of people that probably also cloistered in Jerusalem waiting for it to be safe? We'll just have to wait and find out. But within that story, there was still confusion and conversion. There was rejuvenation 
and rejection. That Peter preached boldly by the power of the Holy Spirit and someone would still just say that it sounded like babbling, that it sounded like drunkards talking. But it caused other people to fall to their knees and cry out for salvation. Because if you gloss over that part, that part of the telling, and you just focus only on, on Peter's sermon, and you hear that one part at the very first scripture reference he gives where he reads from the Joel, the prophet, and he says, and everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Such good news that is. And that's where my oversight is. That's where my blind spot is. That the great omission is that the Holy Spirit is the power through which people are saved. Yes, Peter quotes in telling us that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But the unaddressed underlying power is now that the Holy Spirit is here. And we'll talk about more of this in the future, but we keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is a person. When we talk about the Trinity, it, it's not a cloud, it's, it's, just, it's not uh, a force, it's not the finger of God doing actions, but it's, it's a person who has a personality, who reacts, who responds. It's probably a little hard to get our minds around it because the Holy Spirit has the definite article B, right? It's, it's, we're talking about, it sounds like a thing, but it's not an it that shows up in Scripture. It talks about He and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus attempted to give some explanation. He tried to prepare his disciples, but you also wonder how much of it went over their head at the time. How much of things go over our heads all the time when the scriptures were finally opened up to us? In John chapter 16, he said, He, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in Because of my oversight and my blind spot, I think I've been neglecting what is more the, the beauty of the full gospel. I'm always happy to share that gospel story with you every chance I get. That people will say, yes, God is our creator. He is our sustainer. But then people will say things like, God is our hope. But what do they mean by that? God is, is good, God is holy, God is just, and that should terrify us. That God has such high standards that, that we, we can't even picture, that we can't even fully grasp, that his standards aren't anything like ours, that he can't tolerate sin, and that he's going to judge it. And he won't let it go unpunished because he is a perfect and good judge. You cannot just forgive and shrug and say, I'll turn a blind eye to justice so that you may be forgiven. What if we had a judge like that? What if, what if we had a judge like that on earth where every time he or she would bring the gavel down and say, you're guilty, but then stop and say, but not really. I'm not going to follow through with any type of punishment. You're free to go. Now, to the criminal, that, that might be a great, wonderful feeling. But what about the people on the other side? What about the people who have been harmed and done wrong and not seen any justice take place? How can they live with that? Who would put up with a judge like that? But God, being a perfect and good judge, just and, and seeking justice, That's why the judgment isn't waived. The penalty isn't held back. It's delivered. Then as Peter read to us, for all who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. That the penalty is put on the Lord Jesus Christ who died cruelly on a cross. A physical death that we witness, but much more probably taking place in, in what goes beyond our minds can comprehend. That he's accepting any punishment due for us. That the death of Jesus reconciles you to the judge. That is how much God loves us. That is why he is our hope.
Did you catch my blind spot? Did you see it? I list out the steps and I seem to make it sound simple. A, B, C, D, follow this path. But it isn't simple. The truth is it's impossible. No one is good enough to seek after God on his or her own. No one can overcome the power of loving their own sin to turn away from it and turn towards God. That requires the power of the Holy Spirit. A conviction of sin. It requires the reality of God's holiness. It requires a heart of stone being turned into a heart of flesh. And that is something I cannot do. I can tell you the message as many times as I can be able to, to relay it to you. But each time there are just words that can fall flat. But for the power of the Holy Spirit. I read this, these passages, and, and I was writing the message this past week, and at the same time, I was keeping an eye on the news we've been going through this week. The news cycle has been going full throttle. There's enough news to, to fill the 24 hour networks, and, and they probably still haven't covered everything. A disturbing tragedy happened this past week where a man in the United States lost his life. And we think in here in Canada that it wouldn't affect us as much or we seem like we probably live in a different world than they do, but it does affect us. It has affected us. Even protests on our side of the border have begun. And some protests are happening, but what's worse than the protests is that it's become into violent rioting because things aren't the way they should be. We live in a world where we believe that the police are meant to protect us. And instead it was caught on camera that a man had his life slowly drained from him. Even if he would have perpetrated a crime that he was accused of, it, it wasn't a violent crime. That he wasn't armed, he wasn't considered dangerous, and he was going peaceably. But then there was a knee placed over his neck as he was pinned to the ground. And it was filmed over several minutes as airway and his blood flow was cut off. It was an act of evil. Of that we can be sure. It's now exploded, opening our eyes to how we deal with things like race relations. How imperfect our world is. And up to last night, as I was watching the news, there were multiple cities with buildings on fire, with, with riot squads, the National Guard being called in. As image bearers of God, people have a sense of, of justice. They know when they see things that are wrong. And we read in John 16 this morning that says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. I don't have answers. I don't know how everything's going to unfold, but if we think, even for a minute, that we are going to fix this with laws and reform, if we think we can solve evil by throwing people in a cell to rot, then we are doomed. If we think we can somehow legislate love, because it's not going to work that way. As Christians, we call the same proclamation that we've always been calling, that it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that people will know the difference to know sin and righteousness. That it will be used to convict us of our need for a savior. That when we look out to the world and we see evil and we know it, that we can also look inside to ourselves and see that we are also capable of all sorts of evil. And we are not going to save ourselves 
from our own hate. We're not going to save ourselves from our own pride, or from our own murderous hearts. But our call is to proclaim that through the gospel, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God transforms, God renews. And we reach out and, and we pray for the hurting and the lost. We not only pray for the family of George Floyd, we pray for the rioters, the protesters, we pray for the police. We pray for the man whose knee was over his neck. We call everyone to repentance. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will come. That will always be our proclamation. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So as we may strive for things like justice in this life, we live in the knowledge that we stand before the throne of God. Our justice is replaced with glorious mercy. If we lived with that knowledge, I do know the world would be a better place. Amen. To God be the glory. Let us pray. Almighty God, we, we've had some interruption this week as we struggle with coming back from the pandemic, opening up life, trying to achieve the balance that we once had. We thank you that we've been able to make these strides. We thank you for the, the health teams the leadership of our government, for all that goes on around us, for people pitching in. May you continue to add your blessing to keep people healthy, to see us through the start of time. Lord, we pray for the unrest that has begun in the United States and now spreading through the world. Eyes being open to injustice, people seeking the world to be made right, for love to conquer over evil. We pray, Lord, that you use this time to call your people, to gather them, spread your message, new life, love, forgiveness, and peace. For the families directly affected. For those whose job now is to step into danger. For the man who committed the crime. We ask that you call them all to you. That they are given hearts of repentance. That they have peace with God. And they know you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn number 399, Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness.
And now may the very God of peace sanctify you holy and preserve you blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ.